All right, good morning. We got quite a few people who arrived early today. And we got more people who are arriving early today. That's good. All right, so um, this is not officially a part of the class, but I have started a live stream already. And this is also why I got the timestamp in the video, you know, just so that you guys can quickly skip over you know, the portion that is not a part of the lecture, because uh, I have to look at the OBS screen to find out where the clock is. So, you know, because the clock is here, so it's pretty easy for you guys, cat hair. So it's pretty easy for you guys to kind of find out, you know, what time it is, you know, in real time, and you can just kind of, you know, skip over the portion that you don't need to watch. So I'm going to turn off my mic because I think I still have some cat hair on the mic cover. All right, got that. It's from my uh, tabby cat, not my other cat. <laughs> All right. So I'm hoping you guys got a chance to kind of review the material. I'm not going to say this, you know, in, you know, the official part of the lecture. Um, so this is kind of, you know, a new way for me to do things now, you know, which is, you know, at the beginning of a class, I'm going to share with you guys, you know, what we have talked about, like in the class that's immediately before this one, because there are a lot of stuff that we have talked about already, and it's not possible to enumerate all of those over here. So I'm just going to quickly go over um, that we have talked about the R and the C functions. You know, one is the single digit sum and the other one is the carry function. But those both of those are single digit. So in order to do multi-digit addition, we got you know these rows defined x, y, q, k, s. And then we also defined, you know, how they are defined, you know, from each other. So the only three, well, I shouldn't say three groups of things that are not, um, they don't have formulae, would be the X and the Y, because those are the inputs. Those are representing the numbers or the values that we want to add. And then K0 is kind of a special case. Most of the time it is assumed zero, but if we want to daisy chain addition, you know, because, you know, um, even with a 64-bit adder in modern processors, if you want to add 128-bit integers, you need to kind of daisy chain those operations. And in those cases, you know, K becomes an input. So X, Y, K, 0 are the inputs. And everything else have equations to define, you know, how they should be calculated. The only one that is kind of tricky is uh, are the carry bits, because, you know, K, I plus 1 depends on K of I. Um, in the most elemental definition, and that's why we have the carry ripple concept. And then what I can do today, you know, as first thing, you know, is I'm gonna, you know, actually show you guys how to make a carry ripple adder. Um, and then we'll, and then we talked about carry look ahead already. Um, and as a result of that discussion, k of i plus one no longer relies on k of i, and instead it relies on only, if I remember correctly, two levels of gates. Okay, the first level are all the AND gates, which can all take place at the same time, and then the second level would be the disjunction gate, the OR gate. And, um, and they do not, k of i plus 1 no longer depends on k of i. The, it only depends on the p and the q's, which are very quick and easy to compute because of the way they are defined. And it also depends on k of 0, but k of 0 is just an input pin, just like the x and the y pins. So there's no calculation involved uh, for anything that relies on k of 0. All right, looking at the time, it's 58. 
Um, so what we are going to do today is to go through um, binary subtraction after I talk about the carry ripple adder uh, because that might help jar you know the memory of some people who did not review the material over the weekend um, and then we're going to talk about multi-digit subtraction um, in base 10 okay you know and then we'll define the structure just like we did with addition with the exception of instead of a K and a S row, we have a T and a D row for subtraction. And you know why I use those particular letters will be you know, disclosed later. And how they are computed will be defined. And then we'll talk about the general formulae of B and R. And then we'll talk about you know B and R as a binary formula formulae when we are working with base two. And then we'll talk about borrow look ahead. So how far we can get, I'm not really sure. Today's lab does not depend on subtraction at all. So even if I can just get through like the first two items in subtraction, we're still good, you know, in terms of the lab uh, material. All right, we've got about 20 seconds to go. And I hope most people are here already. And I got four people on YouTube the rest on Discord. And let me see. There's a quick way to count the number of people on Discord. Or not. All right, so it is nine o'clock. I am officially starting the class. Um, so this is you know kind of a summary. You know, once you know, if you have heard me talk about this already, just bear with me for the next ten seconds. So this is a quick summary of what we have already talked about and what we are going to talk about. And today we're going to start with the design of a carry ripple adder, just so that we can you know that might help you know, remind people what we have been talking about for the last week or so and then after that we're going to move on to subtraction okay so we're going to treat subtraction kind of like how we treated addition you know basically you know we just want to find a very quick way to perform uh, subtraction when we all have our transistors that's kind of the bottom line all right so let's do the first thing first which is to work on our carry ripple adder okay um, so one caution, I have said this last week already, is today's lab, your lab, is to, to is to is based on carry look ahead. Okay, so what we learn about the carry ripple adder, for the most part, is not applicable. Okay, so a little bit of it, you know, the way I use the gates or the um, excuse me, not the gates, the use the, the way that I use the input pins and the output pins and the splitters may be transferable to your lab, but for the most part, it does not. Okay, so I just want to give people fair warning um, before we start that. All right. So I'm, log I'm starting Logisim on the side, and you should be able to see Logisim right on, your, um, on, the, on the screen that is being shared. So the first thing I'm going to do is to... Um, make two, three input pins. The first input pin, oh, I don't need to zoom in all that much, so we're going to zoom out a little bit. Uh, this is based on what we have already talked about last week. So we got X as an input pin, and Basically, this is just the circuit implementation of what we talked about last week. As I said a little bit earlier, um, this is it serves a few purposes. You know, the first one is to show you guys what a carry ripple adder looks like, and the second one is to remind people what we have been talking about, uh, which is basically binary addition. You know, all those uh, strange names like you know Q as a row and so on. And this one is K0, which is an input, and it is only one bit, because we only talk about uh, bit zero. Yes, Jonathan is correct. This is the unofficial homework assignment. Um, so hopefully some of you, many of you, most of you, all of you, 
have some time <laughs> over the weekend to at least think about it, okay? So even if it was just a thought exercise and you just scribble down, scribble down something on a piece of paper, it would still be much better compared to not doing anything at all, in my humble opinion. So, you know, I'm, you know, that's just what I'm talking about here. Yeah, exactly. So your answer may not look exactly the same as mine, you know, because the, the way I structure the circuit may not be exactly the same as how you would want to do it. However, um, we'll, uh, we'll find out, okay? So, so what we want to do is to, the output is going to be the sum and also K3, which is our overall carry of adding to these two three bit numbers. So I'm gonna have the output pin, you know, put here. And this is gonna be our actual output, which is sum, which is a three bit wide output pin. And we have another one, which is just one bit wide because that's our K3, bit three of the carry, and it's only one bit wide. So there we go. All right, so what I have done so far is to define the interface, which is basically the, if you if you want to look at a circuitry as a function, this is what I have just defined the parameters and also the return type you know, of a function. It's the skeleton of a function, you know, how it interacts with the outside world, okay? The world that is outside to this particular circuit. Oh, okay. Um, so let me, I can certainly just do that. That's the easy way to do it. There we go. All right. Um, okay, cool. So now we have the sum K3 as output pins and we want to figure out what we need to put in here in order to perform the addition, okay? So then we have to think about, okay, it's fine. So how do we do the addition? We know there's an R function and a C function, right? Because you know those are kind of really useful, but both of them can be implemented using just a single gate, okay? Um, the question is, you know, what are we going to do here? I mean, if we are to use, you know, just AND gates and exclusive OR gates and OR gates, okay, because in order to combine the two ways to contribute a carry from a previous column to the carry of the current column, we need an OR gate, okay? Um, so that's kind of complicated. We can indeed just use a whole bunch of uh, you know, individual AND exclusive OR, or gate, okay? We just use a whole bunch here and then use a big splitter and just make a whole mess out of this. So instead of doing that, we are going to do something slightly better, okay? So what we're going to do is to try to build circuits that are reusable. In other words, in programming terminology, we are trying to make subroutines so that we can reuse, you know, portions um, of the code and we don't have to basically copy and paste all over the place. So that's what we're going to do. We go to project and then we add a circuit. So this circuit is going to be called a half adder. Okay. Now, obviously, if you have never heard of half adder, you may not know how to implement this, but that's okay. So that's what we're going to do here. So a half adder is just going to do, it's going to take the, the two inputs, the two bits that we are at, trying to add, and it will produce a single digit sum and the carry corresponding to adding these two single digits. So by itself, it's rather easy, okay? We have you know, two input pins, both are single bit, and it has two output pins, and both are single bit as well. All right. So instead of confusing you know, these two input pins with the actual um, binary numbers, X and Y, that we want to add, I'm going to call these two just U and V. Okay, um, so this is U and this is V because all I want is for one of the output pins to be R of UV and Logism does allow you to use, you know, um, labels, you know, that are kind of like its own equation. So this is going to be the carry of U and V like so. Okay. Um, I'm just checking the text channel, making sure that I'm not missing anything. 
but the notification sound is on so I really should not be missing anything there all right so now we look at R and we look at C okay both of these functions are already defined you know f specifically for binary operation in other words we're not going to use arithmetic addition comparison and so on we're going to use logic aids okay so from last week's discussion we know exactly what gate we're supposed to use so we know that we are supposed to use an AND gate to compute the carry and make sure that we only use as m we only specify the number of input pins that are necessary because if you leave any input pins unconnected that's potentially a very very bad thing to do in real life so we probably don't want to do that here so here's an AND gate with only two input pins and that's for computing the carry bit and then we also need an exclusive OR. Now, for those of you who say, yeah, but you are not following following your own notes, okay, because we are supposed to be using a complicated way to compute exclusive OR, that's fine, okay? You know, so instead of using this, okay, let's get rid of this, and, and, and then we use the other way to do it. So the other way to do this involves the use of two AND gates and a single OR gate. All right, so we stand stash of OR gate here is single bit and we want to make it smaller with only two input pins there we go all right so we know the two outputs should be arranged or the two inputs you know should be arranged kind of like this and then the output you know goes to the R thing okay so I'm gonna look I'm gonna make this circuit look very very ugly so for those of you who really cannot stand, you know, designs that are <laughs> that have wires you know, flying all over the place, I am sorry, but it's it's that's uh, besides the point. Okay, all right. So we know that in order to do the exclusive OR, we have to negate one of them, you know, for each AND gate. Okay, and leave the other one non-negated. So as it turns out, there's a very quick way to do that. Okay, if you want to negate an input, okay, now if you want to negate the output, you have to change the gate type from AND to NAND. But that's not what we want to do here. We just want to change the input. Okay, we want to negate one of the inputs. So as it turns out, if you go to the properties of the AND gate, um, you can negate individual inputs. So in this case, for the for the first one, I want to negate the top. And for the second one, I want to negate the bottom. Okay, so when we see the bubble, um, it means negation. The first time we saw, you know, this type of notation where the bubble means negation, was the discussion of the p-type um, transistor versus the n-type transistor. So if you, so it's just a mild reminder for people, you know, to, you know, basically we use symbols in a very consistent way. So we'll put one here, we'll put one over here, and put one over here. And then V, on the other hand, will go to the other input for each of these gates here. There we go, and there we go. And we're missing one more connection, just like that. All right. So now we have a really ugly you know, gate. Okay, you know, I could have used exclusive or exclusive or and make this look very nice, but you know it's okay. Now not a problem. This entire part here is really just exclusive or. Um, now let's go ahead and turn this into its own component. So let me before before I turn this into a component, you know, using the component view. Um, uh, appearance sorry this is called the appearance are there any questions about this circuit okay about what it's doing here all it is doing is a convenience that's all okay all right and it should you know be consistent what with what we talked about last week all right so to turn this into a component we're gonna go to the appearance view okay everything looks good um, except you know I personally would definitely try to put in some comments so we got U V and then this is the R of the two bits and this is the C of the two bits I'm not gonna use your know, R open parent U V close parent you know just because it's apparently pretty clear to me you know what it is okay 
And then we're going to move the text a little bit just to make it look nicer. Totally optional. There we go. All right. All right. So that's all good. And it's kind of important, okay, when you turn in the homework assignments, if you need to turn in a circuit as a homework assignment, it is very important to make sure that uh, the positioning of the pins in your design is at least consistent with what is pictured in the lab. I'll tell let me let me uh, tell you what that means. So in the uh, in the lab, I might show you just you know where you know the UV and the R and the C pins are. So what you need to do is to make sure that U is on top of V and then R is on top of C, and they are kind of left right in this particular order. Now, if you want to move it further apart, if you want to move the U pin up a little bit more, that's actually okay. It's not a problem, okay? But the general positioning needs to be consistent with the picture in the lab because otherwise, when we make, you know, when we look at the appearance, these pins will be moved around and that makes the circuit not compatible with the tester that I might have made for grading that particular lab. So you got to ma maintain the relative positions. Now, let's just say that you have moved things around a little bit and you want to make sure that you did not mess up the ordering. You can always click on a particular pin and the picture in picture will show you, you know, w what pin it actually correspond to in the circuit itself. So you can use this method to double check to make sure that, you know, the, the pin positions have not moved, okay, you know, before you turn it in. If you have moved those you know, pin locations, there are a few options. You can just make a new design, okay? Just to go to uh, project, add circuit, make a new one, copy and paste. And as long as the pasted, I think, as long as the pasted version has the right pos relative positioning of the pins, I think the appearance would be right, okay? I'm not 100% sure because I'm not sure whether the appearance also gets copied or not. I do not believe it gets copied. So that's important for the lab okay all right so now that we have a half adder okay um, some of you are probably already thinking okay if there's a half adder there has to be a full adder right because it only makes sense that we have a full adder if there's a half one so now we're going to make a full adder so we add circuit and then we have full adder f a and this is the one that is actually pretty useful okay so so we this time we're going to have the x of i okay so this is x i and the next one is going to be y i okay so here we have y i and then we also have k i okay now i use these specific terminology just so that you know it is consistent with my notes, okay, you know, with how I do the equations, except of course in this case the i is not subscript, okay, but it's kind of understood when it is just x i, it is x subscript i when it's y i is y subscript i and so on, and then the output of this would also be something that should be familiar to us in a certain way, um, so it's going to be s i, you know, bit i of the sum. And the next one is going to be a little bit interesting because it's going to be k of i plus 1. So this is k of i plus 1. All right, so the reason why I turn you know this into a circuit is because, well, I mean, if you want i to be 0, then we have, you know, a, you know this will handle a single column in the multi-digit edition. If you want k of 1, I mean, if you want um, the next column, we just have to substitute i with 1. So this is a universal circuit for every single bit, okay? We can just reuse it, you know, over and over and over again, which is kind of nice. All right. Oh, okay. Click on the wrong window. So now we're going to look at this and go like, hmm, how are we going to do this, right? So the first thing we know is we need q of i, okay? How do we compute Q of I? And you guys will remember Q of I is really just the exclusive OR between XI and YI. So we could just use um, an exclusive OR gate here. But that would defeat the whole purpose of, of, using, of defining a half adder in the first place. Because the half adder has the uh, circuitry to compute the OR you know, function 
and also the circuitry to compute the C function. Now, when our focus is Q of I, we really just need, you know, the one half of the circuit of the half adder. But we'll go ahead and find out you know, what we're going to use the other one for. Okay, so we're going to slap a half adder here, and then we connect X to um, one of the input pins. We connect Y to the other input pin. Oops, uh, there we go. And whatever is coming out of R here is Q. But you look at the outside, uh, the output, you know, portion of this circuitry, and go like, but where's Q as an output pin? Well, Q is not an output pin. It's just internally consumed within this specific circuit. So it's not an actual output pin, but it doesn't really hurt to kind of comment and say, hey, you know, if I need to point out where is Q of I, this is where Q of I is. It is the output of the R output of a half adder in this case. All right. Hmm. So as far as the S pin is concerned, we are almost done, right? Because you know, the S pin is relying on the R of QI and KI. So we got QI here, we got KI over here, and we just need R you know, to generate the S of I. So you go like, oh, we need another exclusive R pin. Well, that's one way to do it, but there's a reason why we have a half adder, and there's a reason why it's called a half adder. So we slap another half adder here, which is going to take Q of I as one of the inputs, is going to take K of I as the other input, like so. And the actual output of this particular half adder, the second half adder, is going to be S of I. All right, so I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions. As you can see some questions here. What is being represented here? Well, we are trying to figure out the circuitry to perform, you know, binary addition. And this is expressing exactly the structural relationship between X, Y, Q, K, and S, all of those rows. Okay? And if those terms, if those you know, names, you know, the rows like Q, K, S, and Y, they are supposed to be related in this fashion, if that is unfamiliar to anyone, it's time to review because that's what we talked about last Thursday. Okay, So I cannot review the concepts in the class because otherwise there won't be any time left to actually teach anything new. So I will have to rely on you guys to review the concepts and then make the connections. All right, so we got a text message. These circuits will be generic enough to say create a four or five bit adder. That is correct. Absolutely correct. So now we look at this and go like, okay, so assuming you guys have already reviewed the concepts and you go like, yeah, yeah, we I can see how Q of I is R of XY. I can see how S of I is R of QI, KI. They go like, oh, what about these guys? Okay, these, this output pin is not connected to anything. This output pin is not connected to anything. This output pin is also not connected to anything. What are we going to do with these things, right? So you might remember um, K of I plus 1 is defined as C of XIYI or C of um, QIKI. Oh, this is C of XIYI. This is C of uh, QIKI. Oh, okay, and, and and we need an OR gate, right? We need an extra OR gate to get this done. So we go here and we get, pick out a OR gate, do the same thing, make it smaller because we don't need it to take up space unnecessarily and change the number of inputs to just two, okay? So we put it here. And yeah, just to make it look nicer, we can space it out a little bit, okay? So we just have to use a OR gate to combine the two C outputs of the half adders. Oops. And now we have a full adder, okay? This is called a full adder because it handles one entire column of a multi-bit addition, okay? And specifically, in this case, it handles a binary um, addition column, your know, multi-bit addition column. Um, because otherwise, you know, if this is not a uh, bit 
two, if it's not in bit two, first of all, these input pins will not make any sense. And two, we could not use um, exclusive OR to generate the Q of I or the R function. All right, so now we have a full adder and we look at the appearance. Okay, looks okay to me. Um, except, you know, we probably want to label things a little bit just so that we don't accidentally put things in the wrong place. So we got X, we got Y, and then we got K. Um, um, I will say, I'll call it K in, okay? And then we have um, the sum bit, and then we have K out, okay? And then I'm just going to move these things a little bit and make it look a little bit nicer. There we go. All right, so we got X, Y, K in, and then the sum bit is over here, and there's not really a whole lot of places to put K out, so K out is going to be outside of the little square, but that's okay, it's just documentation purposes, and this is fine. All right. So now we go back to the main circuit, and then we ask, how do we make use of the full adder? The first thing is, we cannot use a multi-bit wire to connect to a full adder, because a full, for a full adder, every single input pin and every single output pin are single bit wide. So the first thing we need to do is to look at this and go like, hmm, nope, a multi-bit thing is not going to work which means we need to use a splitter, or two splitters in this case. And then the output is only a single bit, and we have to combine those single bits into the sum, which also means we need a splitter for that as well, except it is serving the role of a merger and not a splitter. So it's going to be a three bit wide um, splitter because you know we are working with a three bit wide um, pin and it's going to split three ways because all three bits are actually important in this case. And we're going to duplicate it twice, okay? Because we got we need two for the two input pins and then we need one for the output pin. For the output pin, we are going to change the um, direction. So we're going to change the facing to west like so. And as long as you know 0 1 2 is in this particular order, this is fine. Okay, there's no need to um, change the uh, the handedness you know of the splitter so we can just maintain it like this okay all right so we have three bit by three bit okay you know x has three bits so we're gonna need three full adders okay so I'm gonna replicate this a few times and now we got all the components that we need it's just a matter of um, how do we connect these things right all right, so let's go ahead and connect these items. The first thing is, you know, we want to split X and Y into the indiv individual bits, okay? So this is going to look a little bit ugly because I did not plan ahead of time, but that's okay because functionally it would still be correct. All right, so here's X and here's Y. And K0 is kind of hanging out on its own. We'll f find out how to use K0. All right, so we'll use this guy here to handle um, the column for bit 0, OK? In other words, I equals to 0 in this case. We are working with X0, Y0, K0. We are, we are generating or we are figuring out what is S0 and also what is K of 1, OK? So that's what this full adder is about to do. So we're going to take bit 0 from x, we're going to take bit 0 from y. Um, yeah, I know this is going to look pretty ugly, but that's okay. okay. Because all we need is to make sure logically the connections are going to the right places. There we go. So now we have x0, y0, k0 as its input, and as for the output, Okay, I'm going to put a splitter, yeah, I'll put it here. So this is actually uh, S0, which goes to bit 0 of the merger. And whatever the output of the merger is, is going to go to the sum bit. Okay, so we got um, column 0 done. Digit 0 is now done. Now we need to handle the next one. 
Okay, I'm gonna stash this. Um, yeah, I think this would be a good place. All right, so this is for uh, digit one. So digit one needs x of one, which is here, and it needs uh, y of one. Okay, so y of one is right here. You can kind of see why I said you know this is gonna look ugly, and it also needs a, uh, k of one. So the question is, um, I don't see any k of one here. So k of one is right here because it is the output of um, it's the k output of column zero. So this is where we find you know k of one. Hook it up to the input pin that is supposed to receive k of one. The output of this particular full adder is going to give us s of one. So s of one is going to go to bit one of the sum. And then this is the carry out of um, column one, which is basically k2. So now we have to use another full adder to take care of that. So I'm going to use about the same geometry here. Yeah. And then we say, Exploding head. Okay. Well, this is really just a graphical view of what the equations that we have talked about on the other day is, uh, is it specifies. Okay, so it really is the same thing except it is done in a circuit way. Uh oh. There we go. Um, and then this is bit two. Uh, this is bit two of y goes to this pin over here, and then this is k two. So k2 is going to connect to k in over here. And then this is s2. s2 goes to bit 2 of the sum, like so. This is k3, OK? Because it's i plus 1, i equals to 2 in this case. So this one becomes k3. And voila, we are done. All right, so. It seems uh, it seems since k2 depends on k1, k2 and k3 cannot do its output until k1 finishes. That is exactly right. So logism doesn't give us any visualization of the propagation, okay? Because it's all internally computed but not displayed. But the idea is, see how this wire is. Okay, let me switch to the poking mode here. See this wire? It's co it's connecting the output of this particular bit um, half adder, full adder to the input of this full adder. This wire connects the output of the second full adder to the third full adder. It takes time for this to get done and then you know it takes time for this thing to get done and then it takes time for this thing to get done. And this is why it's called carry ripple because if we can um, have down to nanosecond resolution either you know stretching out the time or something we would be able to see, oh, the, the pin, input pins changes, and then this wire, you know, gets updated. And when, now, X and Y are already done by the time, you know, we get to the second full adder. But the second full adder is not going to output anything correct until the uh, K in pin getting the, um, getting its input from the output of the first full adder. Until that is correct, the output of the second full adder is not necessarily correct. And the same thing applies to the third full adder. Until the second full adder is outputting k out correctly, the third full adder would not be outputting its own output correctly. So it's not like the full adders do not output anything right away. It's just that whatever they're outputting right away may not be correct. So it takes time for the carry bits to ripple through in order for the last or the most significant carry bit to be correct. All right, so I'm going to go read the text channel. Um, each K output is like determining whether we need to carry a one. Well, I mean, that's based on the equation that we talked about last week. Yes. Uh, K of I plus one depends on K of I. What would we call this circuit? It's a three bit by three bit adder. Or uh, Dalton is even more correct. It is, it's a three bit by three bit carry ripple adder. Very nice. Okay, so I am going to 
put here. So this is a three by three carry whoops ripple ah, adder. There we go. Very nice. Yep. Yep. All right. So once we have a three bit by three bit at a circuit like this, um, it's good to test it, right? So the question is, how are we going to test something like this? So the answer is obviously the test um, circuit that I have given you these these days. That will be ultimately the test, okay? Because you know, um, because the input, all the inputs, only combine to like what seven bits, right? So seven bits will give you to the power seven, which is one hundred and twenty-eight. Uh, possible input patterns, you know, to exercise every single possible input patterns, there will be 127 of them. Um, and what you do is you build a circuitry around that, and then you use the actual adder inside Logisim, which is down here under doo -doo -doo, arithmetic. So you basically pull its own adder, and then you parallel feed, you know, the X and Y and K zero to both to your, to your own implementation, and also to the actual correct, you know, adder that is built into Logisim. And then you you just have to compare the output, okay? And if they are the same for all 128 cases, then you can rest assured that your implementation is correct from the standpoint of it does give you the correct output, okay? On the other hand, if for at least one of the inputs, you know, they differ, then you probably will have to look into the, the your implementation and see why it is not, why they are not the same, why the two circuits are not giving you exactly the same thing. Now, if you don't want to do something like that, you can always just kind of individually test these inputs, right? So you want to test the tricky ones, okay? You test the simple ones and then you test the tricky ones. So you want to say, okay, I'm just going to add z add 100 to 0. The output is just the same as x, okay? That's expected. And then you do the same thing to y, okay? No, okay? That's pretty easy. And you can kind of do it to one each of these bits here, okay? So there are six, you know, basically trivial cases like that. And then you can test the carrying circuit, right? So you want to say, okay, what if I have one plus one? Okay, one plus one is zero one zero. Okay, that the carry seems to work. And what is two plus two? Okay, one zero one zero plus one zero one zero is one zero zero. That seems right. And then you can test the next one, which is one zero zero plus one zero zero. And in this case, the sum is zero 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 with an overall carry of one. So you can test all of these things, and then can test, okay, what if I have one here and a one here? That would still be, be that would still be giving you zero one zero because you know that's what how it is supposed to work. So you can give your circuitry, you know, some test cases like this, um, or you can use the test generator that is included in the lab. So in the in the lab I actually gave you the wrap around thing, you know, to test, you know, all the cases. So that's kind of, you know, one way to, to test your circuit. Um, are there any questions at this point about carry ripple adder? I'm, at, I'm pretty sure some of you can make this diagram look better, as well as the individual components, especially the half adder. Okay, that looks kind of ugly. And then the full adder is, eh, I guess the full adder is okay. Not too bad. So are there any questions about carry ripple and how this circuitry, along with the definition of a half adder and a full adder, connect with the concepts that we talked about last week? That's basically the definition of the Q row, um, the definition of how the K bits are calculated, and also how the S bits are calculated from last week's discussion. Um, HA is really just a function that computes both R and C at the same time. And the purpose of the half adder is I don't want to have to copy and paste this circuitry in a full adder. 
you know, again. So I'm just extracting the common portion and say, hey, we'll just make it a subcircuit and instantiate two of those over here instead of just, you know, copying and pasting a whole bunch of circuits over here. All right. So the half adder, once again, computes R, which is, you know, based on the not U and V or U and not V, that's R. C is really just a conjunction, and that's, you know, something that we talked about last week. All right. Okay, so I see... How can you test all 128 points quickly? That's what the test driver is about. Okay, so the test driver has is a clocked circuit. We haven't really talked about what is a clocked circuit, but it draws the input test cases from a ROM component. So it basically stores a whole bunch of bit patterns for the ROM, and then it feeds through, you know, every single case, you know, into your circuitry, and then the output can be logged, okay? And, you know, when we get to the uh, the lab, you know, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, but they, but basically, you're not going to do this manually, okay? That's, it's just not very reasonable to do this manually. Um, that's what the test driver is doing for not only this lab. I mean, the test driver concept is not new. Um, I have given you at least two test driver circuitry for the previous labs. So that's the idea of using a test driver to test test case to you know, basically present test cases to a circuitry and log the output of the circuit being tested. Then we can compare the log uh, against the correct the output of the correct circuitry. Then we can tell whether they are the same and if they're not the same, you know where the differences are. All right. So I'm not seeing any additional questions here. Okay, so I'm going to move on to subtraction then. All right, not seeing any objection. So we're going to move on to subtraction. So subtraction is... Down here. Oh yeah, subtraction is a whole lot shorter because we know most of that stuff already. <laughs> Alright, so this is the binary subtraction module. And since we finished binary addition last Thursday, and you guys have already heard me preaching a whole lot about, you know, oh, yeah, by the time we finish one section, you guys, you know, should read ahead of me so that you will have some rough idea of what I'll be talking about in the next lecture. So I'm assuming that many of you, most of you, all of you, have already read this particular module and have a general sense of what we are going to talk about today. And by the way, this approach of taking classes, you know, is applicable to all classes and not just mine. <clears throat> all right, so we're going to go start with, you know, bin uh, not non-binary subtraction first, okay? So I'm going to present a few test cases just so that you guys, you know, kind of know, you know, where we start with and where we're going with all of this discussion here. So we'll start with in base 10. Okay, because we are familiar with base 10. So when you were a kid, or if you already, if, or if you know someone who's in elementary school trying to learn subtraction, so the easy subtraction stuff is when um, the minuan, which is the number being subtracted, is larger than or equal to the subtrahan, which is the value that you're subtracting from the minuan. Okay, so when we say x minus y, x is the minuan. And y is the subtrahend. Subtrahend. There we go. Okay. So it's good to present these terms 
they are not really as important when we add adding because addition is commutative, which means no matter how you call the two things being added, it doesn't really matter all that much. But in subtraction, it does matter because it is not commutative. Okay, so the x is the mean of n in x minus y, and y is called the subtract hand in a subtraction. The result is the difference. Okay, all right. Knowing this, okay, we think about base 10 first, okay, single digit subtraction. Once again, we have a table that is 10 by 10. I think for the illustration of this, I think it is best, okay, it's, it's going to be helpful to use um, a spreadsheet to show you what I mean by that. I mean, you guys probably know what I mean already, but I just want to show you why spreadsheets are in general quite useful for many things. So I'm using um, LibreOffice Calc, which is really just a, um, a spreadsheet application. You can use probably you know just about any spreadsheet application you want to, and basically be able to do about the same thing. And I'm going to change the the zoom ratio back to close to uh, 100. Well, this is actually 100%. So the table starts with zero and now, because this is a spreadsheet, I can use a formula to compute the value of a cell. That really is why spreadsheets are so useful, because we can do something like that. Now, obviously, when you're saying, you know, but you just have to type 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 9, you know, what is the big deal of using a formula to do it? Well, first of all, I'm lazy. I don't really like to type. It's easier to drag a mouse pointer to generate all of these cases where I need it. All right, so now we have a nine by, I mean, excuse me, 10 by 10 matrix, so to speak. Now we want to look at each one and say, okay, this is going to represent, um, so let's call all of these, you know, um, okay, these are going to be our minu ends, okay? So I'll label it minu end, minu end, I think that's the correct spelling. And all of these are our subtract hands. Okay. All right. So for each cell, I want to use whatever value, is, whatever value is here and whatever value is here, in order to do the actual subtraction. Okay. Um, so this is going to take a little bit of magical work. Okay, because I'm going to have to use um, a function called indirect. And indirect needs to refer to um, a reference, which in this case is composed by, um, let me, I think it's called address. Yeah, there we go. And address is going to take a row and a column. So, um, so we're going to refer to row one. So row is going to be one and then column is whatever the column of this cell is. So when you use the column function, it just returns the column number of the cell uh, where, you know, where this equation goes into, okay? So address one and then column um, function is gonna re give us the um, address of this, of, this, of this particular cell you know, on the top, which is our minu n. And then we want to, okay, I'm just, making sure I get enough of the parentheses. There we go. And then we can now subtract the subtract hand, which is, you know, this particular column here. So once again, we use indirect, which is sort of like the asterisk, you know, operator in C, C++. Um, and then address is sort of like the ampersand, um, except in this case, um, the way you specify an address is not really just a location, which is kind of linear. In this case, you know, we are using the row and column number to generate the address. There you go. And I think somehow the number of parentheses does not seem to match. Um, we got indirect, open, open, open. Okay, we are missing one. There we go. Uh, the other way is not going to work, unfortunately. Um, found an error. Enter. Do you want to accept the correction? Sure. No, that is... Well, okay, that method... Oh, right, right. That would actually work. I didn't have to do it this way. Thank you. But since I have already done it this way, <laughs> I'm just going to do it like this. But... Um, 
yeah, so Justin is correct. You know, I could have used. Um, um, okay, so with Justin's solution, um, the dollar sign, you know, one has to apply to the one, and the other one has to apply to A, and then the other letter really should not be a dollar because we don't want those to. We we want those to vary as we copy the equation. But this work method works as well, even though it looks it just looks ugly. That's all. So anyway, we have a table of subtraction here. Okay, the first row, which is you know this one here, is kind of trivial because we are using zero as a subtrahend. Anything minus zero is the original value back, and that's why it looks identical to the first row. And the same thing applies to. Um, well, okay, there's no such thing as the same thing because um, it's not commutative. So that's why, you know, the symmetry al along the diagonal line is not there anymore. Okay, with addition, we have a symmetry. With subtraction, we do not have a symmetry. This is the entire table. Um, so when we present a question of, you know, what is, let's say, 3 minus 7, most people would look at this and go like, oh, that's negative 4, right? which is a correct answer. But looking at 3 minus 7 as negative 4 is not going to be helpful when we need to perform multi-digit addition. So instead of saying this is negative 4, OK, this is a new way of looking at things. OK, it's not in the notes, but it is. it might be helpful to someone. OK, so this may be, mm, I can look at this as 6 minus 10, right? Now, I know the, the connection may not be clear, but at least this is not wrong, right? 3 minus 7 is negative 4, which can also be expressed as 6 minus 10. Okay, very good. So in this case, we're going to look at this as um, 6 is the single digit difference, and then we have a 1 is the borrow. Okay? In other words, we look at the 10 as 1 times 10. This is the borrow, you know, um, the borrow amount. In this case, it has it's 1 and this is the single digit uh, difference between the two digits. Okay, so that looks kind of confusing. Let's look at another example then. 8 minus 2. Okay? 8 minus 2 obviously is just 6. But I can also write this particular 6 as 6 minus 0 times 10, can't I? I know it doesn't sound very smart to make 6 more complicated than it has to be, but this way I can now also say that 6 is the single digit difference and 0 is the borrow, okay? Because the 0 is referring to how many negative tens should we you know, subtract? Um, let me take it back. What is the multiple of 10 that we need to subtract from the single digit difference? And in this case, we don't need to because 8 is greater than or equal to 2. All right, so just a different way of looking at things. Um, I saw somebody else typing in the text channel and it's the actual content is not in the text channel yet. So I'm not sure whether that was an actual question or not. All right. So all right. So based on what we have observed here, when I'm using an example or I'm using examples to illustrate the concept. So now we want to generalize this. Okay? We want to say, okay, what is the general way of computing the single digit difference and what is the general way of computing the borrow? So just like before, we're going to use a function to do this. And the functions are going to use it with unsigned types, okay? Unsigned integers the whole time. So this is the single digit um, result of a subtraction. Um, the single digit x is an input. The single digit y is an input. And we're going to work with base 10, okay? So right now we are very specific with you know, our base and it's just using base 10. So based on how we want to use, okay, this is our r value. This is our R value. So based on these observations, what is the equation or what is the expression that we need to put here? What should we put here? 
Does anyone want to kind of give it a shot? We know x has to go from 0 to 9. We know y has to go from 0 to 9. But we don't know whether x is less than y or not. Okay? Mm, nope. Not that, that would not work for base 10. Yep, base 10. Daniel is right. <laughs> We're working with base 10, okay, which turns out to be a little bit more cumbersome than base 2. But we can do it, right? So the only matter is, do we need to add a 10 first before we do the subtraction? But there's another way to do it. Because we know x is from 0 to 9, and we also know y is from 0 to 9. So that means if we just add 10 to x first, that is guaranteed to be greater than y. Okay, no question about it. Then we can do the subtraction from y. But then some people are going to say, but what if x is actually greater than or equal to y? Then we have something that is more than um, 9, which is not good as a single digit result. Well, that's easy. We just mod it with 10. Then we're done. Okay, so. You can plug in the values to figure out whether this is going to do the trick or not, right? So you plug in 3 as x, you plug in 7 as y. So 10 plus 3 is 13, 13 minus 7 is uh, 6, 6 more 10 is 6. Works out for the first case. I mean, look, let's look at the second case. x is 8, y is 2. Right, so 10 plus 8 is 18, 18 minus 2 is 16, and 16 mod 10 is 6. Oh, okay, so seems to work. Now we're going to work with the other one, okay, which is uh, the borrow. And the borrow function is going to be the B function. Okay, so, and someone is going to be asking at least you know, this question in their heads, which is a very good question to ask, is tech. How come you did not change the name of the R function, but you changed the name of the carry function? So I'm going to get to that part in just a little bit. Okay, This one is pretty easy. Um, if x is less than y, um, then we return the value of 1. Otherwise, we return the value of 0. That's all. Okay, that's how, that's how we determine whether a borrow is necessary or not, is whether the single digit x is less than the single digit y. If it is the case, yes, we need a borrow. We have a borrow of 1, otherwise we have a borrow of 0. So are we doing okay so far looking at the single digit difference and the single digit borrow from the perspective of base 10? All right, excellent. Cool, cool. All right. So this also means, you know, if we were to modify this, you know, to, you know, basically, you know, calculate the R and the B in this case, we would be pretty easy to modify this table. And this is why um, base 10 is such a mess because it is, I mean, kids have to remember a pretty large table when it comes to subtraction. And that's why division is the last arithmetic operator that kids learn because, you know, uh, because in order to perform division, people have to be able to perform, guess what? Multiplication and subtraction first. And that multiplication is not even the long form multiplication. You know, it has to be the short one. So people have to be really familiarized with um, addition and uh, multiplication first, and then the subtraction thing. That's why division is kind of you know nasty, especially in base ten. Anyway, um, okay. So so now we look at this and go like, what about base two? Well, if it's base two, just change. This the only part that is specific to base ten. Which okay, it's I misspoke two. The only two parts that are based ba that are specific to base ten, two two, and then now we have you know R, you know for base two. All right, okay, so it's time to take rows. I'm gonna take a pause here, and then we'll take row. And. Okay, you guys will kind of like the word for today's rotating activity. All right, so the answer. Okay, this the the word that I choose. You know, usually not always, but usually has to do with um, the concepts that we are learning. So last Thursday we learned about 
carry look ahead. So I was thinking about hmm, look ahead, carry look ahead. So we are now looking at borrow look ahead. You eventually we'll be looking at borrow look ahead, which is look ahead but the opposite direction. So I just decided the opposite of look ahead is nostalgic. <laughs> so I'm going to put it here um, into the text channel. And then release the row taking activity. Yes, the good days. Yep, nostalgic. Just copy and paste. <laughs> Just copy and paste. I know this word is not commonly used, but if you copy and paste, it cannot go wrong. All right, so I'm going to take a quick view. <laughs> Maybe. You guys have no idea who is actually first. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm uh, appreciative of the enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, I know how uh, waking up for this class can be a problem these days. No, I don't think uh, Vlad is the last. I'm pretty sure there are people who have not completed that yet. All right. Ten o six fifty nine because it's due at ten o seven. Living dangerously, it's kind of like you know waiting until the gas tank, you know, the indicator has turned on, and then drive you know, a few more miles before you know refueling the gas tank. Yes, I, I have a colleague, you know, who uh, used my lecture recording as an, an insomnia cure. Apparently, it was actually quite uh, effective as well. That's what she told me. Hey, if you wake up, you know, you know, and learn something about assembly language programming and it cures your insomnia at the same time, I would call that a win, a win-win, actually. There's no downside to it. <laughs> yeah, me neither. All right, well, never underestimate your subconscious because I think, you know, it's just like an iceberg. Uh, the conscious part, which is what you think, you know, you're thinking, <laughs> is the tip of the iceberg, which is about one-tenth of the full capacity. The, the real power portion, the real portion that actually does all the computation, the learning, the reorganization of the information, is the subconscious, which is the 90% that you cannot see with an iceberg. I think that's actually true for most people. All right. <laughs> Bob Ross. Yeah, I don't think I have the hair for that. I can wear a wig. Okay, so getting back. Getting back to the boring stuff, okay? So if you are prone to falling asleep, try to pinch yourself now so that you don't fall asleep. So we're going to work with uh, base 2 now, okay? So I'm going to copy and paste this, okay? And say, okay, let's work with base 2, okay? So we just change the constants of 10 
to 2. That's all we need to do, right? I mean, the logic is still the same. I mean, you know, if you follow the logic and go like, yeah, this makes sense you know, in base 10, then it will still make sense in base 2. And the B function does not even change. Or the B function does not depend on the base. All we need to do is to compare the single digits, x and y. And if x is less than y, then we automatically say, yep, we have a borrow of 1. All right. So, um, Daniel, you have no idea how many times I can drive from work to home and not remember how I got home. <laughs> and I drive a stick too, yes. I suppose I have to drive a stick without a synchro mash if I really want to be mindful about my driving. That would probably, you know, require a little bit more conscious effort on my part to get home. Uh, I have a Miata. And it, it's it's one with a with a short uh, throw you know, stick. It's extra short. I should I should put it extra short, and it has a lightened flywheel, which is makes the car very prone to stalling. You know, at the stoplight, and I could still get home without remembering how I got home. Yeah. Oh yeah, it does have a uh, uh, Torsen limited slip rear differential. It could drift. Yep. All right. So cool. So now we get back to <laughs> the concept here. And this time we want to work with, guess what? Base 2, right? So in base 2, okay, so we're going to say x, we're going to have y, we have r of xy, and then we have b of xy. But this time it's only in base 2, okay? So this is in base 2 only. Okay, so x can be 0. And let's look at r first, okay? r is pretty easy. Um, if x and y are both zeros, then we have 2 plus 0 minus 0, which is 2. 2 mod 2 is 0. b is even easier because 0 is less than 0 is false. So it is a b, you know, would be 0 in this case. What if x is 0 and y is 1? So in that case, uh, we have 2 plus 0 minus 1, which is 1. 1 mod 2 is 1. And then over here, we have um, 0 is less than 1 is true, so we return a 1. And then over here, we have 1, 0. The r value is going to be 2 plus 1, which is 3. 3 minus 0 is 3. 3 mod 2 is 1. And then the b is going to be a 0, because 1 is less than 0 is true. So we return, whoops, sorry, take it back. 1 is less than 0 is false, and that's why we return a 0. There we go. Well, there are places where you can legally drift. You know, you can go to a, uh, it's, the, it's a parking lot Grand Prix. Um, I just forgot the term for those things. I just forgot the term. Damn. Um, Stockton. They organize these. Um, it's not really a race because you're, uh, it's just timed. Autocross, that's it, right? Thank you. So autocross. So in the autocross, you can drift. I mean, it's not against the rules to drift, even though you might actually end up losing time when you drift. So, okay, getting back to this R here. So 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 minus 1 is 2. 2 mod 2 is a 0. And then 2 is less than 2 is false. And so the borrow is also a 0. Mm, I don't know about that. A 335i is a little bit wider than a Miata, and you know, given some of the courses are very tight, um, you know, the Miata would, can can still choose a line, but your BMW may not be able to choose a line. I've seen Corvettes doing autocross; they're very, very good. Um, except, you know, you don't really get to choose a line anymore because you can barely fit between the cones. Anyway, so now we have a table. So we got this interesting table here because, hey, maybe there was a reason that kept, Tech kept the notation of R after all, because look at this R column here. It was identical to the R column for addition. Hmm, okay, so R is settled. So in binary, 
r of x, y is still the same thing as x exclusive or with y, or if you prefer the kind of longhand version of this, is it's not x and y or x and not y. Okay, so it's still the same. Okay, no, not a problem. Now the question is, how do we find, how do we define b of x, y? Hmm. Well, it's not exactly an and, right? Because you know it has a one only when x is false and y is true. But the other way to say this is to say not x and y, because if we want um, the borrow function to be a one if and only if x is false and y is true, then we can just say, hey, you know, we will just we, we just negate whatever x has, okay, and then use that to end with the value of y. Then we'll make sure that only this particular row here, with x being 0 and y being 1, it will only be this row that can give us a result of 1 for the borrow function. So it is kind of like you know, borrow, I mean, kind of like carry, except we have to negate x first. So any questions about, you know, the r function and the b function, how we got to these two binary versions of the general equation or the general function for single digit result after a subtraction and the borrow after a subtraction. Do we have any questions about that? No questions? Okay, all right. All right, so this is great news, right? You know, it's great news because now we also have a um, way to turn arithmetic operations into binary or logical operations, which, knew, which we already know can be done using transistors. So this is good, okay? But now we have a next question. The next question is, but how do we perform multi-digit subtraction, right? Because we want to find out the structure of how those digits relate to each other. So before we do anything in binary, we will work with a test case in base 10 first. So we'll start with, uh, okay, we'll start with 100, 200, and hmm, I'm just trying to think of a, a good example to use here. Uh, 210, um, and that's our minuend. Our subtrahend is going to be, um, I, let me see, 213. Um, okay, that's probably a good one to use. All right, so most of the time we write this, you know, using the borrow notation, which kind of sticks some tiny little ones, you know, between the digits and stuff like that. But this time we're not going to do it. We'll basically just use one row for Q, one row for what I would call T, which is the borrow, but I don't want to use B because B is already the name of the function. So the row is going to use T, which is, you know, the abbreviation of take, okay? It's because we are taking something from the next uh, column. And this is going to be um, D for difference. There we go. So Q is has a definition. Q of I is defined to be just R of XI, YI. Okay, same definition as last time. And then T, we're going to have to work out this one a little bit. Okay. All right, so 0 minus 3 is, as a single digit, has a result of 7. Uh, T0 is just like K0, which is usually assumed to be 0. And as a result, we have D being 7 here. However, we can say that, but tech, you forgot something, okay? 0 minus 3 has a borrow of 1. So T is actually the borrow, so we need to put a 1 here to remember that we, uh, the previous column, or column 0, requires a borrow from column 1. So now we look at this 1 minus 1. 1 minus 1 by itself is not a problem, it is just a 0. But this 0, you know, minus the 1, which is the borrow, um, that was necessitated because of column zero, is going to give us a nine here, which is the single digit so, uh, difference of zero minus one. And that also results in a borrow over here. So now we have two minus two, which is a zero. Zero minus one, once again, is a nine. 
and it has an overall borrow of 1 over here that is not represented in the difference. So we look at this and go like, hmm, does that make any sense to us? Okay. Well, it actually does make sense because even though it seems really odd that 210 minus 213 is positive 997, but the one that we have borrowed here, this is borrowing a thousand. Okay. So you can kind of think about, you know, you have $997 in your pocket, but you owe the bank $1,000. So your net worth is still negative 3, which would be the same as 210 minus 213. So this borrow is very important because even though it is not considered a part of the difference, it is still influencing the value of the subtraction, of the result of the subtraction. It is still a part of it. It's just not represented as a part of the difference. It is represented as an overall borrow in this case from the quantity of 1000. So from this particular example, we can kind of see how t works, right? t is kind of like k. So t of i plus 1 is defined to be the borrow of um, xi, yi, okay, xi, yi, and we have to add to it uh, the borrow of um, qi, ki. So it looks very similar to the k function, except the, the way we define the b function is different from the way we define the c function. The difference is actually a lot simpler. The difference is really just the single digit uh, difference between q of i and t of i. That's all it is. ki is not here because ki is the carry of digit i, so it's not going to be here. Uh, this is t of i, sorry. Oh, 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 I see. Okay, sorry. My bad. T of I, not K of I. Thank you. All right. So we can see a structure that emerges to be quite similar to addition. Okay, because your Q of I is actually identical to Q of I in addition, especially in binary. But in terms of structure, it looks kind of you know, very similar as well. Uh, T of I is very similar to K of I. Uh, except instead of using the C function, we have to use the B function. Okay, so this is the general structure. This general structure here applies to any base. Okay, base 10, base 2, it doesn't matter. It's still the same structural rule that will relate all of these digits in order to perform a multi digit uh, subtraction. So the interest to us is not in base 10, the interest to us is in base 2. So in base 2, specifically in base 2, Q of i is now, okay, so let me be more specific, in base 2. So in base 2, Q of i is now X of i exclusive or with Y of i. Once again, you know, we can use the long hand or the short hand, doesn't really matter, boils down to exactly the same thing. D of i is also easy. D of i is just Q of i exclusive or with T of i this time instead of K of i. So T of i plus 1 is the one that looks uh, a little bit different from before because B this time is um, the negation of xi and yi. And then we have a plus here. Once again, we're going to use arithmetic addition. I'm going to say add. Um, the negation of qi and ti because that's what b is about okay the b function is all about negating the first operand and the second operand in this case so you know that's how we put it so once again we have this add thing here and we go like mm, we don't like add okay because you know it's an arithmetic concept we want to convert everything to boolean or logical operations so now the question is the same as last time. So the question is, can these two be ones at the same time? Let me highlight which two. So can this component be a one and this component be one at the same time? Because if that is possible, then we cannot replace the add with an or. On the other hand, if we can guarantee that this term and this term cannot both be ones at the same time, then we can replace the add with a disjunction or, which makes it possible to implement everything using logic gates, which then translates to being able to trans, uh, to use transistors. Uh, we got three minutes left. Okay, 
So since we got three minutes left, let me just think, think, think. I think we can, we have enough time to do it. So the logic is about the same. Okay, so not x i y i being a one implies. What does it imply? Well, it implies your x i is a zero, and y i is a one. Which in return implies q of i is a one, right? Because q of i is the exclusive or between x i and y i, but if q of i is a one, it implies not q i is a zero, which then implies not q i t i is a zero. Oh, okay. So that means. If we know this component is a one, then we know this component cannot be a one. Okay, it has to be a zero. Let's work the other way around. Okay, not q i t i is a one. What does that imply? It implies q of i is a zero, and it implies t of i is a one. And in return, what does that imply? It depends on how q of i is implemented. Q of i is the exclusive or between x i and y i, which means if it is zero, it tells me that x i is the same as y i, um, which implies not x i y i has to be a zero. Does everybody see how this argument works? If I already know that x i and y i are the same, they're both zeros or they're both ones. Then I automatically know that not x i y i has to be a zero because if they are the same, and I negate one of them, that means one of these two terms, not x i versus y i, one of these two has to be false. So once again, you know, we have just proved that if we uh, assume this is a one, then that this one has to be a zero. So that means you know we can now say ah we don't need add anymore we can just use an or in between. So once again we have just translated arithmetic operations into pure logical or boolean operations. So that's where I'm going to end the lecture today because I want to set up the lab so that you guys can get started with the lab. <clears throat> So if you don't fully get the subtraction stuff, don't worry because that's not what today's lab is about. Today's lab is all about carry look ahead. So this is based on what we talked about last Thursday, and also a little bit of what we talked about today as a review of what is R, what is C, you know, how do we generate the K bit. But that earlier, you know, the circuitry that I talked about was about carry look ahead. Uh, it's about carry ripple adder. Okay, so that circuit is not really applicable in this particular lab. In terms of concept, yeah, it's kind of related, but in terms of the actual implementation, not so. So let me um, let me release it first. Okay, I have to go to edit first before I can release it. But you need to know the passcode anyway, so getting here first does not hurt. So the passcode is three x three part one, which I'll copy and paste. Okay. There we go. And you have until 120 to get this done. Now, with this particular one, it is really important to go back to the notes, you know, and the definitions of what we talked about last Thursday. And the first thing you need to do is to review what is uh, what each term is representing. OK, uh, let me save and publish first and then I'll continue to yak on for maybe another minute and then I'll go get something to eat and then be back to answer questions. So it is really important to review um, these things. OK, so it's really important to do all of this stuff here and the carry look ahead derivation. Um, also result in the definition of the P and the G terms, okay? And the definition of those two is quote unquote, it's in the notes, but it's also kind of stashed in the place, you know, in a, you know, in a very invisible way, because I was hoping that you guys have been taking notes. So every time we talk about a definition of a new term, you would have you know, your own entry in your own notes, or at least, you know, have a highlighter to highlight, you know, 
um, my notes. So you have to understand all of these terms. Okay, x, y, easy. They are input pins. K zero input pin, pretty easy. The Q terms, the S terms, the P terms, and the G terms. Okay, so all of these things you ha you kind of have to have a pretty good understanding first. You know, in order to do the lab for today. And at the end of today's lab, make sure you save the file because that's the basis of the lab that we're going to do on Thursday. Okay, so you know, save it on your own hard drive or you can put it onto Google Drive. Doesn't matter where you stash it, just make sure that you can retrieve it on Thursday so they can continue with the construction of the circuitry. And that's it. That's all I have to say. Are there any questions I can answer when I'm still in synchronous mode, you know, using the voice channel. Doesn't look that way. We got a few people typing, so I'm going to wait here until I confirm that there are no questions, then I'll stop the streaming. The passcode doesn't seem to work. Hmm. It's 3x3 part 1. Try copy and pasting it. Um, about the example. Okay, let me go back to the text. There we go. Okay, so 210, these are all base 10. So 210 minus 213 has a result of 997 with an overall borrow of 1. That would be the answer to this specific question as an example. Or I'll be referring to a different example somewhere else. Okay, all right. Yeah, the concept is, you know, basically, okay, if I were to write this out, 210 minus 213 is uh, basically 997 minus 1000. Okay, and I'm going to put a 1 times 1000 here. This is the borrow of 1, overall borrow after the entire subtraction, and this is the actual difference between the two numbers when, um, when we cannot use negative values. So since we cannot use negative values, but we do have the capability of specifying the quantity of a borrow of 1,000, so we specify the borrow to be 1 in this case, so that the overall value is still a negative four, uh, negative three, sorry. Yep. I cannot copy my digits, right? So even though the actual value is still negative three, it is not expressed as such because the expression is only making use of 997 and one as a overall borrow. That's the concept of uh, what this multi-digit subtraction is trying to illustrate. All right, okay, cool. Um, so with that out of the way, X, Y, K, 0 are not output pins. They're all input pins. It's in the lab. Yep, exactly. Yep. So read the instructions carefully, okay? Read it slowly and carefully. All right, so I am going to stop streaming, and then I'll be back in about, yeah, give me about five minutes. And then I will start to answer questions.